Thanks. Good morning. Welcome to Worship for Reformed Church. Why don't we stand and greet each other in a Halloween candy stupor? Shake hands, touch an elbow, smile, wave. Good morning again. Good morning. Good to see you. It is amazing that with just one extra hour of sleep, there is so much more conversation happening on a Sunday morning, so more smiling faces. Hmm, interesting, interesting. I have a few conversations, or a few conversations, a few announcements before I see if anybody else has any announcements. Um, adult Bible study after worship, revelations in the consistory room. Senior high youth, middle school youth both meet tonight, 6.30 in their respective areas. Uh, info about the Good News Club for K-5 through five after school is in the bulletin. Information about walking in family life here and when that opens and starts is in the bulletin. Grief share Wednesday night and also um, don't forget their special Grieving Through the Holidays, Surviving the Holidays, which is November 23rd. That information's in here, too. Uh, Mary's not here today because she and Al Vanderlyn and her at her seal. Um, so we'll be praying for them later. But if you have any questions about the holiday one especially, you can contact Mary. Uh, just a reminder, next week is our annual congregation meeting and the soup uh, cook-off immediately after, oh well, no, yeah, immediately after the meeting. So we'll do worship, breakfast like normal, Sunday school worship like normal. We come in here for a congregational meeting. Everybody is invited to stay for that. You don't have to be a member. You only have to be a member to vote. Um, and then afterwards we have the soup supper and we're in, or soup lunch, and we're encouraging, if you've got them at home, to bring muffin tins so that you can fill each one with a different soup and don't just fill up on one soup and go, oh, there's 48 other soups. How am I going to taste all these soups? And we also don't want you to take a spoon and just go down the row either. So bring them up and think if you have it. Otherwise, we'll have some bowls and you just have to pace yourself. Um, that'll be after worship. So here's the tricky thing that we're letting you know now. So long story slightly shorter, when the new bank took over from the old bank, they shifted when the treasurers here at First Reformed Church, by about a week or two, got our bank statements, which meant we were showing up on the first Wednesday of every month to do consistory, but had no bank statements and couldn't do the budget. So every month we were a month behind in our bank statements. So after, I don't know, a year of that, somebody finally goes, why don't we just meet the second Wednesday of every month? And it fixes the bank thing. And everybody was like, that is a genius idea. And then lo and we get all the way to fall and the arena goes, you know what, you're not going to have a consistory meeting now before the congregational meeting and you have to approve elder and deacon slates and budgets. And we all went, oh, yeah. Because today would have been the day we would have had budgets in all the boxes and on the tables. And you take the budgets home as a congregation and read through them and scan them and go, this is good. Or I have some questions. And we will ask them next week at the congregational meeting. So here's what we're doing instead. Either Monday or Tuesday... Uh, because first we got to get six elders and a pastor who aren't super tech savvy to all online approve the budget. Lorena is then going to email the budget out to everybody or mail if you don't do email the budget. So everybody will get it hopefully between Tuesday and if it's through the mail, Thursday or Friday. And you'll have at least a few days 
to look through it and consider it. Um, and then next week when the treasurer comes up, you will have brought it with you and have it in hand and go, ooh, I have a question or I have no questions. And um, there you go. Any questions, thoughts about that? Perfect. Just watch your email. Uh, other announcements? And maybe that's all I've got for business or announcements. Community Thanksgiving service. Uh, this year, it's always a community service. All the churches get together. This year, the Christian Reformed Church, a couple blocks to the northeast of us, is hosting at 6 p.m. Um, and just a reminder on that day before the service, uh, youth from around town go door to door and get canned goods for the food pantry, and then they bring it all to that service. And there's a supper beforehand, I think at 5.30, and then the worship at 6. I think that's all the announcements I have. Does anybody else have any business or announcements before we move on to prayer concerns? Andrea. Oh, my word. Hold on. Stop. Oh, gosh. Teresa, did you agree to this? With her help. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> We're going to do it together. Because she knows what she's doing, and she can teach me again. Anyway, so, we're, so if you would like to play, we are looking for people players. If you've never done it before, and you're like, that sounds interesting, but I need to know more, just grab one of the two of us and just come and play. And we can get to know each other and the evenings, and that we would play in December. Don't get my hopes up for this, because I love bells, especially at Christmas. So, so you're going to play? Is that... Am I going to play? No. <laughs> Any other announcements before we move on to prayer concerns? Oh, Karen. Oh, Dave Bruxford just said he'd do bells. I do. Okay, but I'm in. Folding chairs for the senior high youth group if you've got any to donate. Any other business or announcements? Prayer concerns, updates that I've got. Uh, Mary, and Al Van, uh, Mary Limerick and Al Vander Linden are at Garcia this weekend and have asked for prayers as they uh, work with the candidates going through. We'll be praying for them. Um, other updates, uh, we heard that Kathy Vriesler had her first radiation treatment this week. Um, and they're 15 minute sessions and she has, I'm not sure how many more weeks to go, but it was a couple months left of that. Um, other updates. I see Steve. He's here with us. So he must be feeling okay. Awesome. And, uh, John Buckley had his surgery and what is another week before they turn the implant on or two weeks? Twenty first. So in the twenty first, I'm gonna go back to the doctor, and that's when they'll switch it on. So we'll adjust it. Okay. He'll go back on the twenty first to have him turn it on, and then he goes back every few days to have it adjusted. So we're gonna pray that uh, he heals well enough for them to turn it on. Doing good. Little earache, but it gets better every day. Good. Um, and Charity, still praying for Charity. She is improving, but uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but the, even the surgeon said it was one of the worst backs he'd seen that he worked on. So we are praying for her continued recovery, but he was pretty confident she's going to feel a lot of relief when she's finally healed. So we're going to keep praying for Charity too. Are there other joys or concerns? Oh, and we had the uh, Jenna Smith Wyatt Bailey wedding here yesterday, and it was packed and it was wonderful just a beautiful wedding and an awesome couple so we're praying for jenna and wyatt and the smith and the bailey families this morning 
um, as they begin uh, their life together as a married couple. Now, any other joys, concerns, or updates you would give me? Yeah, Pastor. This is a definite joy. I just would like you to know that um, we can take real happiness and satisfaction in the fact that in two days we will not have to hear any more political acts. <laughs> So you have a lot of faith this is all going to be over by Tuesday night. And I'm going to f*** to that. And if by the time I go to bed at night, it's not over, I'm going to come call you and say, how many more days do I have? The size of a mustard seed. Oh, oh, boy. I'm going to add that to the joys and concerns. Yes. We will be, even if we are the only ones, we will be the ones that regardless of what happens this week or a week from now or two weeks from now, we just go, God's got it. God's got it. God's got it. We, I can't remember who I was discussing it with this week, but it doesn't matter. I think it was somebody here. But the, currently, 50% of our country thinks the other 50% are complete fools. And the other 50% thinks the other 50% are complete fools. And then whoever I was with went, which means 100% of our country is probably complete fools. And I went, that is actually pretty smart. And I think there's some scripture about what happened when the people begged for a certain leader and then God finally gave in and gave it to him and nobody was real happy in the end. So just remember that uh, at the end of this week. God already told us where, whichever way this goes, it's not going to fix everything. There's only one being in this universe who can fix everything. So we're going to keep faith in that. Sorry, I went on a political rant this morning. Any other? Oh, and uh, Arnie Sohn for president, if you're writing in. Any other, <laughs> any other joys or concerns or updates? I write it in every time. Oh, there. I think I'm still on. That's joy, and I'm glad he's in the safe spot. But it's also a concern because we got another call that it's been a little bumpy for him. Hmm. And so I just pray for Joe. And I guess all the men at Teen Challenge that, you know, I don't think we understand how strong substance abuse addiction is and how a bumpy past is hard to overcome sometimes. So just for him and Thank you, Eric. Let's pray right now. We'll pray for Joe. Heavenly Father, we know that uh, of all the things in this world that seem like they can get a death grip on us, addiction is by far one of the worst. So we are going to pray for Joe this morning because we know he is in the exact place he needs to be at Teen Challenge. He is surrounded by faithful men and women who are going to raise him up and support him and encourage him. But God, we also know that the only thing that's going to truly break through is the spirit that you will lend to Joe's heart. So God, we are praying this morning that in the coming days and weeks and months for Joe and the other men at Teen Challenge, for the women down the street at Clearview, for all those we know who are struggling with addiction, God, we are praying that you would find miraculous ways to speak to their hearts. And show them that there is nothing stronger than your will. And that you can lead them through this. God, we pray for Joe. Amen. Thanks, Eric. Other joys or concerns or updates? If not, I would say take one more chance. Let's stand up. Look at somebody around you. Smile and say, I'm glad you're here. We'll have the praise team come forward and open us in some opening worship. Let's worship the Lord.
Children are invited forward this morning for the children's message. Come on down. If you've got any coins or bills, oh, wave them in the air and the kids will come and grab them. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to sit over here today. While they're coming forward, William, I forgot to tell you, I'm going to use the guitar right here in just a moment. Come on down. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy, this is a crew. Okay. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Come on down. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness gracious. Any other hands out there waving? If not, you guys can grab a seat. Grab a seat. There's some more. There's... You got a handful? Oh, my goodness gracious. This is one of those mornings. It's going to overflow. Got it? Oh, no. You okay? Everybody grab a seat. Grab a seat. I don't want to bonk anybody. You hold it. I'm going to put it behind me because I'm afraid it's going to overflow if we hold it too much. Oh, thank you. A mint. Hmm. Now, did that come out of a package or did you find it on the floor? Oh, so I gave it to you. Excellent. Any others? All right. Grab a seat. All right, I got to reach back here. You still have one? Where you at? Come on up. Now, here's what you're going to do. This morning, you're not going to look at me. You're going to look out there at them. Look at them. Turn and look at them. And you got to be really quiet because instead of me asking you guys to do something this morning... We're going to do something for them, and we're going to see how well they can do it, because I'm pretty sure most of them, if not all of them, know what we're about to do. And if they do it, anybody out there who does do it can also come up and get a sucker if they want after. But you guys are going to watch, so if, like, if you see Gavin right there not doing what we're about to do, and then you see him come up for a sucker, you can step forward and say, Gavin! I forgive you, and you can have a sucker, but next time be honest, okay? I want to hear it loud and proud. I bet we haven't sung this song. Teresa, do you remember the last time we sang this song at First Reform? Zacchaeus, listen, listen, listen. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. They seem like they know it. Let's see if they can get even louder. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up and he said... Now this is the fun part, because some people... Do this next part like Jesus. This is Jesus talking. They do it like Jesus is really angry. Like, Zacchaeus, you come down. And some people do it really like friendly. Like, Zacchaeus, you come down. And some people do it like stern. Like, Zacchaeus, you come down. So we're going to see how they do it. Here we go. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Okay, this is a congregation that learned it kind of stern and mean. I prefer to go, Zacchaeus, you come down. Because that tends to be how Jesus talked to people. So we're going to try it again, but like this. Zacchaeus, you come down. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. That's a lot of suckers, and I don't have enough. And I'm going to apologize right now. But as Gavin will tell you, we're a forgiving conversation. And just say, Jason, be honest next time with how many suckers you have. But I will let everybody have a gumball from my office who wants one. Let's do it all together now that we know how to do it the right way. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. That's, I heard still a few people. That was us three. 
But you were saying it nice, weren't you? These are the children you raised when you sing the song sternly. For I'm coming to your house today. For I'm coming to your house today. For I'm coming to your house today. We are going to read this story. A lot of people think this is like a children's story, but it's really a story for grown-ups. And it's a great story to remind us that when Jesus comes to meet people, very rarely did he point at them and get angry and start yelling. Almost, almost every time when Jesus would see somebody, he would let them know, I know who you are. Or he would let them know, I love you. Or he would let them know, I forgive you. Or he would say to them, follow me. And I grew up kind of hearing that song with Jesus going, Zacchaeus, you come down from that tree. And it took me a long time to realize that's not, yes, you come down. That's not really the way Jesus talks to people when he talks to them. So we're going to remember this week when we're praying or reading the Bible or with our friends that Jesus and God, when they talk to us, they come to us in a loving way. So we're going to pray. And we're going to thank God for loving us. And I'm going to pray that I have enough coloring sheets for everybody. And I know we have enough suckers. So should we pray? All right, let's pray. Fold your hands. Close your eyes. Oh, you want to pray? Anybody else want to pray with Peter? Sure. Okay, Peter will start. And then if you want to pray, you can come up afterwards. Ready? Yeah. Thank you for everything that you gave us. Thank you that you gave us the food, and we thank you that you died on the cross to forgive our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for the Bible stories that you gave us in the book, and thank you for that you died on our sin and you rose again. Anybody else? Yeah, come on up. And thank you, God, for all for letting us live until we die. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You guys can grab your sheets and your colors from Levon. Your suckers are over here. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. He's so good to me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up and he said, like a cowboy, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. Would you stand as the praise team comes forward and leads us in our next song? Hymn number 16. Tell me the old, old story.
Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. I think this one is long enough. I'll read this one, and then uh, we'll read the next one together. From Genesis, chapter 15, this is God's covenant with Abram before he became Abraham. This is God doing something he will do throughout the whole rest of this big book, which is come in and tell somebody he's going to do something wonderful with them, and they don't even come close to understanding what it means that God is saying. But because they have faith and they're willing to trust God after years, or in this case we find out centuries, God does fulfill his promise in ways they can't even imagine. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Even a logical human being, if taken outside and told to count the stars, will probably give up in the hundreds, if not the thousands. And even way back when, these people knew that there were more than likely tens and hundreds of thousands of stars. Now we know that there are millions and trillions of of stars, that our universe is so full of stars, it would be impossible to count them. And if a man like Abram had one child who was an heir, there is no way he can logically understand how that one child will go on to produce millions or even hundreds of thousands of future grandchildren for Abram. It made zero sense. Even at his age, he was like one baby, No way. Millions? I don't understand. But then we jump all the way to Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. And we'll read this together. This is hundreds and hundreds of years after the promise that God made to Abram that he would be the father of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of heirs. Let's read this together. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. God was setting up all the way back in Genesis that if you want to be considered in the family of God, there is absolutely nothing you can do to get into God's family other than to say, I have faith, I'm part of God's family. I have faith in God. Abraham could not even fathom that hundreds of years later, he would be the example of, if you have just even this much faith, that means you are in Abraham's family. And if you are in Abraham's family, you are in God's family. Abraham could not have conceived how he would be used as an example later. All he could do in the moment was go, my wife and I are way too old. There's no way we're going to have a baby, let alone thousands and possibly millions. But someday when he reached eternity, I'm guessing he understood How many people this week handed out trick-or-treat candy? Four. 
Wonderful. How many people went trick-or-treating this week? Oh, okay. Twelve. Perfect. And the rest of you, I guess, were busy. I don't know. Um, I've mentioned this to a few of you in the last few weeks. There are times when I realize something at my advanced adult age. Something occurs to my mind and I realize I must be the dumbest person on earth that I never understood what that meant until now. I've been asking people the last few weeks about what I'm about to ask you. And so far, everybody has either been like, I have no idea that that's what that meant either, or one or two people have said, duh, that's obvious. I've known that since I was a little kid. This joke, this trick-or-treat joke that I've heard since I was a tiny child, all of these years until I'm 48, ends up having a deep, theological meaning that I've never understood. Why did the chicken cross the road? What? It? I heard it. To get to the other side. My whole life, now wait, don't nod, don't shake your heads. My whole life, I thought the joke was dumb chicken's going to get hit by a car. Why does a chicken want to cross a road? I just heard somebody explain this about a month ago. The joke actually means the chicken is ready to go to the other side of eternity. It's a double meaning. Now, I'm almost tempted to turn around and not look, but raise your hand and be honest if you understood that was the meaning of the joke your whole life. You're wrong. I wasn't the only one, honestly. I don't believe those four kids in the back understood the depth of what the other side meant. A silly kid's joke, I had no clue, had a terrible pun that actually gave it a rather deep other meaning. The chicken was done. He wanted to go to the other side. Genius. Genius. Any kid who comes up to me next year with that joke at my door gets two pieces of candy because that one is deep. Sometimes I learn ways to study Scripture the same way that opens Scripture up to me in ways I never understood before. We did this a couple weeks ago. I'm going to do it again. There's a pastor named Viss who said when he does Scripture, he asks these three questions. What does this passage say about What does this passage say about God? What does this passage call us to do? It's kind of a version of what's called Lectio Divina, except it's even simpler. Just flat out say, what does this passage say about human beings? What does this passage say about God? What does this passage call us to do? We are going to read the very common children's Sunday school story, of a wee little man named Zacchaeus from Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. And the first question, as I read this, I want you to consider is, what does this story say about human beings? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and and to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, 
because this man too is a son of Abraham. For this man came to seek and to save what was lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Until Aaron said to me, what does this story say about humans? I had only really ever thought about the people who look at the tax collector and go, why? Why? Why is Jesus spending time with him? But I heard that question, and for the first time I thought to myself, a tax collector, who we know from many other stories, is probably somebody who's not super close to God. And we kind of infer that from the story because Zacchaeus has heard about this guy, Jesus, but he doesn't really know much. So he goes all the way to the point of climbing a tree not to talk to him, not even necessarily hear him, just to see him pass by. And I thought to myself, ooh, for people, just the idea of God is enough to make most people, at least a few times in their life, sit up and pay attention. Just give it a glance. Just go, I don't know what's true or not true, but I'm going to at least look in the direction of where people are telling me God is at work. There's a whole group of people following him who are hardcore believers, but there's one person in the crowd who's saying, I don't know if I buy any of this, but I really want to just take a peek. What does this say about God? This is where this story blew my mind, and probably for the first time in my life, I started looking at this story as something much deeper than just a children's story about a funny little man who gets to meet Jesus. The fact that God is surrounded by hundreds of adoring people. The fact that Jesus is walking down the street and could at any moment stop and preach to hundreds and convert tongues and do all kinds of ministry, he also stops and looks at the person in the crowd with so little faith. The only faith they had was just enough to look at Jesus and go, what's going on with God? God recognized the tiniest amount of faith in a human being and still stopped and made time for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was not necessarily a temple goer. He probably couldn't go because people hated tax collectors. He was probably a cheat and a thief because most, if not all, the tax collectors were. He was not a follower of Jesus to know exactly who he was and what he was doing. All he'd heard was, God is coming by. I just want to take a look. That little amount of, I just want to see, is enough for God to go, I see you too. Here's why we're singing this song wrong. Zacchaeus come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Stop singing the song mean. Here's the second thing that popped out to me about Jesus. Zacchaeus comes down, welcomes him gladly, whatever that means in your mind. I imagine they smile and hug. Jesus doesn't say, follow me down the road farther. He doesn't say, sit down and listen to this sermon. He doesn't say, I'm going to hand you off to one of my disciples so they can teach you my teachings. Jesus immediately goes beyond the normal social boundary of even people back then. This would never happen today, let alone back then, looking at somebody he just met and saying, I'm going to come to your house right now. Hundreds of people surrounding him. But he says to the one person, the whole crowd goes, why are you going to his house? And Zacchaeus doesn't go, I got I to gotta, I gotta call my wife or clean up. I got to get things in order. I don't have anything to eat. Zacchaeus goes, ooh, this God who everybody is telling me is so huge and important, all I had to do is look at him and he let me know I am important enough 
He's going to also follow me to where I live. He wants to invest in me. Not just a little bit, not just with some scripture or some prayer. God wants to come to where I live and talk to me. Zacchaeus professes he has faith. Zacchaeus professes he wants to change his life and give back some of the things he has stolen. Jesus says to him, today's salvation has come to this house. And then we get to this last sentence, which I have thought about this before, but this story just sends it home in a way that I don't think any other does. For the Son of Man, which is what they called Jesus, and again we've talked about why they called him the Son of Man and not just the Son of God, because he was God and man. It was a reminder that God came down and put on one of our bodies and suffered and was tempted and went through everything we go through. Just so we can't say, well, he's Jesus. He's better than us. He's more powerful than us. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm going to show you that what God is asking is possible. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Which means that if I, I hope, I hope, and I've been hoping wrong for a lot of my life, If I was walking down the road, my hope would be that if I saw Jesus coming the other way, he would embrace me, which he probably would. He would be happy to see me. He would listen to my prayers. He would give me a piece of advice. He would show me love. But I don't think Jesus is going to say, let's go to your house. I think, and I hope, and this sounds weird, but I think it would be a meeting where Jesus would come and spend a moment with me and then actually keep moving. Because my hope should be Jesus isn't here to spend time with me. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. More than likely what this says about God is If he showed up today, he wouldn't walk in this church. He probably, hopefully, wouldn't come to my house. He would see me on the road and shake my hand and say, Oh, man, I love you. I'm so glad to see you. And then he would keep on walking, but he would say, Follow me. Because I am also not supposed to be here to just hang out in church with my family. I am supposed to be the hands and feet and mouth of Jesus, and seeking the lost to let them know they can be saved too. And then you get to the part where you say, what does this passage call us to do? And this was the first time I read this passage and said to myself, ooh, ministry is not exactly what I think it is most Sunday mornings. And I'm not talking about ministry as in what I do as a pastor. I mean ministry as what we are called to do All of us, seeking the lost, serving those in need, feeding the hungry, clothing the people without clothes, doing everything we can do to serve others. That is what ministry is. If I had been in Jesus' shoes with my brain, I would have gone home at the end of this day and said to the disciples, that was crazy. Who got a count on how many people were there today? Did you hear when I said this? And these people laughed, or did you hear when I said this, and these people cried? Did you hear how many people gave their lives today? Did you hear how much money we raised for the needy in town? That is where my mind goes when it comes to Jesus' ministry. But Jesus was the only person in that crowd that ministry meant the exact opposite. For Jesus that day, ministry meant even if there's only one person here in the middle of hundreds and maybe thousands that needs to know the love of God, that is the mission. If 1,000 people go home completely good and comfortable and forgiven by God, great. But I'm more worried about one guy in the tree 
who's just here to take a look. Because he's the one out of all these people that really needs ministry today. I don't know what that passage calls you to do, but I do know from this passage and many other passages, all it takes for a human being to get in contact with God is take the briefest of looks and God will find a way to respond. And not just respond, but often respond in a way where he doesn't just want to have a glancing hello. He wants to come home. He wants to be in your life okay, that for some is uncomfortable. There were probably many people like Zacchaeus who said, you know what, today's not a good day, come next week. But for those people who take a look and then are willing to bring him home, their lives can be changed forever. And then when they go out, they have brand new eyes and can look at the crowds in the world and go, well, those are the people that I would be comfortable hanging out with and talking about God. But more than likely, they're going to go home and talk about God and be comfortable by themselves. Who might be in these crowds that need someone to notice them today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how silly are we to read parts of the Bible? A burning bush, an ark full of animals, a little man in a tree, and think to ourselves, these are children's tales. For God, even in those children's tales, you reveal a depth that can keep us asking questions and learning new answers our entire lives. God, as we think about all the things humans, people consider signs of faith, may we also remember this morning that when you are looking for faith, especially from those people who do not know you yet, it can be a simple glance in your direction. A simple question of who is this Jesus and what is going on, that can be enough for them to open their lives to the point that they are changed for eternity. God, even the world tells us what a healthy ministry looks like. It's like large numbers and large offerings and large vacation Bible schools. large worship teams. And God, we humbly realize this morning that none of that was the healthy ministry of Jesus. That the healthy ministry of Jesus was to find those in the crowd who needed Him most. And to invite the crowd to love and support them. God, as a church, as you have called us in this community of Prairie City, we come to you every week with a list of people's names, of prayers, of joys, of concerns, people that we as a congregation support and love and encourage. God, would you continue to challenge us to be the congregation who supports Jenna? And Wyatt, who is there for them as a church family, not only if they're in attendance, not only if they are permanent members of this church, but any time we see them to understand from the time that Jenna was a little girl, this church made a covenant with God to be her family. And when she married Wyatt, we took a covenant with God to be his family too. Lord, let us remember that for all of the infants who were baptized, all of the families who joined, all of the teens who have made profession, all of the people who have gotten married, all those who have come through these doors to take a look at you and let you come closer. God, we have a covenant to be there for them. God, hear our prayers again for Joe, 
Lord, we know that there have been miraculous stories that have come out of Sheepgate and that it is possible for that to happen again and again and again. So, Lord, we heap huge blessings on Joe that you would continue to mold his heart after your own and bring him through Sheepgate closer to you. God, continue to hear our prayers for Kathy as she has started her treatment. For Steve, Charity, John as they recover from their surgeries. For Brandon as you continue to heal his heart after his surgery. Lord, for patience and strength for Kurt and the Bryles family, Lord, who we will continue to pray for because we know that even if we don't understand your promises now, you transform pain and waiting into something beautiful. God, hear our prayers for Mary and Al as they minister to those very people this weekend that you speak about in the story. God, we know there will be people in the room with them who walk in with maybe the smallest amount of interest in you possible. And yet as they play music, as they speak, as they fellowship, you have the chance to use Mary and Al and all the folks at Curcio to change lives for eternity. God, we pray for this country We pray that regardless of what comes this week, we will be the people that refuse to give in to anger. We will be the people that refuse to give in to hopelessness. We will be the people who recognize violence as the exact opposite of your way. We will be the people who pray for those we don't understand. Pray for those in turmoil. We will be the people that when it is brought up to us how terrible things might be, we can be the ones to smile and say, thank God He is in control. And He has led us through so many things in this world for so many centuries that an election a drop in the bucket compared to what He has in store for us next. God, as we come to You this morning, we realize that even the simple teachings of Jesus have more depth than we could possibly imagine. And so when we asked Jesus, how should we pray? He gave us the words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Amen. Would you stand as we receive our benediction and the praise team comes forward to close out with one more song together. Let's stand for one final song of worship. As you leave this house of worship today, I would remind you of this. There will be people you will meet this very week who might see you coming and go, I know how these people of God act. I don't want to talk to one of them. And they will be shocked when instead of greeting them with anger, you say, hey, I want to talk to you. Let's talk. How can I invest in you? How can I come close to you? How can I support and encourage you? This week of all weeks, we have a mission and a call from God to let the world know this is one body, one spirit, one God, one baptism, Go in peace as one family. Amen.